So right now, we'll proceed on to the second part of our program, which is um, two speakers followed by a panel discussion. Alright. I hope everyone has a very good idea of what Cairo Society is about now, from the video and Timmy's introduction. So right now, we have the privilege of getting two very distinguished speakers to share with us their experience. Right, Mr. Hugh Mason, and Mr. Douglas Abrams. So allow me to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Hugh Mason. Mr. Hugh Mason is the co-founder of JFDI Asia, Asia's number one business accelerator program, which has a 60% success rate, taking groups of entrepreneurs to investments, averaging $600,000 in 100 days. Alongside Mr. Hugh Mason's main work as JFDI Asia's CEO, he also serves as a member of the Scientific and Business Advisory Board at the Institute for Infocom Research in ASTAR. Having successfully founded Noratio, a successful independent TV production business which won awards including a British Academy no Award nomination and made over 150 documentaries about science and technology for Discovery Channel, Hugh con continued to co-found Cambridge Partners in London to provide finance and advice to marketing, media and technology businesses. And over a decade, he has helped to raise or directly invested 50 million US dollars and personally mentored over 300 innovative companies. He is also a regular public speaker, teaching at New York University's Teach School of the Arts and the Singapore University of Technology and Design. So without further ado, may we please welcome Mr. Hugh Mason onto the stage. Can't hear you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Thanks for energy. Thank you very much. I have brought this presentation to you tonight with great thanks to everybody at the Cairo Society because it seems to me that we are at a fascinating time in history. As you've just heard, innovation is incredibly important for our future, but it's also an amazing time to be an innovator because we now understand how innovation happens in a way that we just didn't in the past. We've moved from a world where everything is about planning and perfecting the future to a world where we can launch things and learn in a completely different way. Let me show you what I mean. If you'd ask someone in the 1950s, where can I get a fantastic watch? Where can I get fantastic engineering? They'd have said, well, the Swiss. There's something about the mountains or the water or, you know, something about Swiss engineering, right? But it was all a bit of a mystery. And then the Japanese got together you know, with Doug Obers Deming and quality control came in, statistical quality control came in in companies like Toyota. And we now know that you can do quality anywhere in the world. It's a state of mind and it's a set of processes, right? During our lifetimes, the proposition I want to put to you is, right now we're seeing innovation going through the same kind of process. Innovation and entrepreneurship are no longer mysterious. There's things that we can understand and we can teach which is incredibly empowering because the amazing thing about an economy built on ideas is that there's no shortage of ideas. The diamonds in this watch, once they're dug up and sold to somebody, that's it. They're only sold once. But if I have an idea, you can have an idea 10 minutes later, and she might have a better one 20 minutes after that. The ideas economy is an ever-flowing fountain of wealth and opportunity for all of us, and innovation is what transforms ideas into real practical products, services, and things that improve the world. So how does it happen? Well, this is where the entrepreneurial mind comes in. Does anyone know who this is? Say again. Thomas Edison, absolutely. Mr. Edison is interesting because all through his life, I don't know if you know, he, had, he held 1,093 patents in his life. For a long time, he was the, the most patented person in the world. I don't know how you'd say it, but he had more patents than anyone else. And people asked him all through his life, what's your secret, Mr. Edison? How are you so innovative? And he'd say, I find out what people want, and then I make it. Incredibly simple. People didn't really understand that at the time, but I think we now have a process which we apply at JFDI called Lean Innovation, which does exactly that. We find out what people want and then we create it. Let me show you how that contrasts with the old view of innovation. One of the things that Edison's famous for is inventing the Industrial Research Laboratory. One of the curious things about Industrial Research Laboratories is that whenever architects design them, they tend to do strange buildings. This is the Schlumberger Research Laboratory in Cambridge in the UK, and it's a tent in the middle of the field. I don't know if you've noticed, but sort of research centres have to be slightly strange places, usually. 
which is why it's quite nice to be in a re remarkably ordinary building here at Biopolis. I mean, it's, uh, you're not treated like freaks in a zoo here, right? You're actually ordinary people too. But of course the public does a whole, have a whole of mythology about innovators. We think of people like Albert Einstein as being you know, very smart, but also slightly strange. Uh, we think of him having these kind of two sides to his personality. The entrepreneurial mind is this strange, you know, split thing. And it's slightly scary. And for that reason, what you do is you pump all the people who have strange ideas into a research centre like Biopolis. You have the ideas on the left-hand side and you contain them. And then very sensible people in suits prioritise which are the good ideas. They hire a load of sensible engineers and they turn them into products and services on the right. Okay. And if the product's a great success, then Nobel Prize is all round, you know, it was all very good. If it's a bad product, then clearly the salesmen were no good. <laughs> this is the traditional model of innovation. It sees technology being transferred out of laboratories and into the real world. And it's not a bad model. You know, if you want to design drugs, this is what you've got to do. You've got to have lots and lots of things you test. You've got to pick the ones that work and you've got to turn them into practical things further down the line. But it is not the only way of working. It's the kind of way that you do want to work if you have a very clear goal. When President Kennedy said in 1961, I challenge this nation before the decade is out to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth, there was a very clear goal. And your job, boys and girls, was to get the man to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth. There was a goal, the job was to minimise risk and maximise return. I think it's rather interesting that this kind of whoops, looks like a kind of a rocket on its side, doesn't it, if you think about it? And it's exactly the kind of innovation process you need if you're going to have a very clear goal and you're going to go towards it. But, things have changed. This is Joe Ito, who's um, the director of MIT's Media Lab. He also runs a fund, Yosni, here in, in Singapore with uh, James Chan. And I'll just let you read what he says. He's talking about a real extraordinary change that's happened just in the last 10 years. If everyone's had a chance to read that bit. We have a different way of doing innovation now. An alternative to the rocket on its side that you saw before. It's an iterative way of talking to customers, talking to ordinary people out there in the world, and involving them in a process of innovation iteratively, spiralling in on what we want to create. And it's fantastically democratic because the technology to do a lot of innovation, to, to test out products and services, is now perhaps a thousandth or a ten thousandth of what it did cost uh, 15 or 20 years ago, certainly in the digital world where I work. The question, you spiral in on, a, on an idea like this rather than uh, trying to aim for it from the start. And it's interesting because the whole discourse of what innovation about has, about has changed, I think. It used to be the case that we asked ourselves, could it be done? That was the question we asked. Now I think we can start by asking the question, should it be done? And only if it should be done, then by all means let's, let's try and innovate afterwards. Different way of looking at things. This lady is one of my heroes. She's called Sarah Sarasvathy. She works in Virginia. And in 19, uh, sorry, 2001, she wrote her PhD thesis. She studied 50 very successful entrepreneurs, and she got them to go through quite a, a long exercise. She's a cognitive scientist. She was interested in the way that they think. And what she discovered is that entrepreneurs who are successful think in a completely different way from people who are taught in business school. People who work in business school are taught to plan and perfect. They're taught to minimize risk and maximize return. Entrepreneurs don't do that. They launch stuff and they learn, and they have a definite set of strategies for doing that in a controlled way. And we teach what Sarasvathy has discovered, and it works. Does anyone know who this is? Uh, I'm going to try and pronounce his name. Is it Cheng He? Cheng He? Yeah. It's either Cheng He or Cheng He. Okay. I'll get used to it. The interesting thing about him as an explorer is, unlike the Apollo mission, the Apollo mission was go to the moon and come back again. Very specific. There was a very clear goal. The goal that the emperor gave Cheng He was very different. It was basically go out and find interesting stuff. <laughs> it was a pretty loose brief. And he did. And that's what entrepreneurs are like. So I want to leave you with an image, really. If everyone remembers this, so is anyone old enough to remember the classic Star Trek? Um, the phrase was, boldly go where no man has gone before. Right? That is what you have to do if you have the entrepreneurial mindset. And I hope that that leads into the topic that uh, you're going to talk about next, which is about taking risks, I think. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.
you, Mr. Mason, for his insightful experience and sharing. So next we'll have Mr. Douglas Abrams, who will share his experience with us. So just an introduction of Mr. Douglas Abrams. He is the founder and CEO of Expara and Expara IDM Ventures, a business accelerator for interactive and digital media companies. He is also a founding partner of Extreme Ventures, a venture capital fund. So all three companies are actually based in Singapore. But prior to coming to Singapore, Douglas managed information technology at JP Morgan for 14 years. He was manager of investment banking technology from 1991 and later head up the Global Markets Internet Marketing Division. He has also served on the organizing committees for Startup at Singapore, Global Startup at Singapore, Startup Asia, and Stanford Global Entrepreneurship Challenge Business Plan Competitions. He is also a mentor of the iGEM Microfinancing Scheme. Mr. Abrams is currently the chairman of the Southeast Asia Business Angel Investor Network. He was previously a member of the steering committees for the NUS Venture Support Fund and the NUS Fuse Fund for Student Businesses. He has served on the board of the Media Development Authority of Singapore and as a member of the Media and Communications Manpower, Skills and Training Council of the Singapore Workforce Development Agency. So without further ado, may we welcome Mr. Douglas Abrams onto the stage. Okay, good evening. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, since you talked about disruptive innovation and the topic for tonight is disruptive innovation and the entrepreneurial mindset, I'm going to talk about the entrepreneurial mindset uh, for 10 minutes. So when thinking about this talk, I'm trying to decide what can I communicate effectively about the entrepreneurial mindset in, in 10 minutes. So I want to talk about what I think it, for me represents the, the core of the entrepreneurial mindset and it's uh, nicely illustrated by my Chinese character. So can somebody, can somebody read the Chinese character for me? Oh, say again. Wei Ji. Your pronunciation is very clear. Thank you. So, and uh, what's the translation of this character? Like, what's a single single word translation? Crisis. So this this character is usually translated into English as the English word crisis. What is a crisis? Actually, we saw on the previous slides talking about the creation of the Cairo Society, that this came from the global financial crisis. So what is a crisis? Or let me ask an easier question. Is a crisis a good thing or a bad thing? Good or bad? So both. In, in what is it? <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, okay, crisis is a situation that has reached a critical turning point, like the global financial crisis at a certain point. At a certain point, global financial crisis became, you know, global financial disaster when it turned down. But we can see that even in that uh, crisis, there were some good things that came out of it, like creation of Cairo Society and the elimination of investment banking from the financial system. <laughs> Although I worked at Investment Bank JP Morgan for many years, but I, but I believe that uh, that was also a benefit of the crisis. So when we break this character down a little further, we see two sub-characters, one uh, usually translated as danger and opportunity, although I understand there's some debate as to whether G really means opportunity or not, but okay, uh, let's just take it from there. So danger and opportunity, or within every situation of danger, there is opportunity. This is very similar to the discussion, brief discussion we just had about crisis. How does this all relate to entrepreneurial mindset? This brings me to my uh, core point, which is, what's the relationship between risk and return? What is the relationship between risk and return? Maybe you haven't caught on to my, my presentation style. I'm not just going to talk. I'm going to talk for uninterrupted stretches of time, and then every once in a while, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to look out at you like this. That means the last thing I said was a question. <laughs> and I'm waiting for a response from you, then you respond, and then I'll continue. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, so we have to do quickly. What's the relationship between risk and return? 
High risk, high return. This sounds really good, right? Let's all say it together. Okay, ready? High risk, high return. Now you're inside entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur, you're thinking every day, and maybe a couple of times a day, am I taking enough risk? I would venture to, to guess that very few people in the audience are taking enough risk. Why do I say that? How many, raise your hand if you're satisfied with the amount of money that you have right now. <laughs> Nobody, right? Why is that? That means you're probably not generating the return that you wish you were generating. Why are you not generating your required return? The reason is you're not generating, you're not taking enough risk. You need to take more risk. If you take more risk, you'll increase your return. In fact, the only way to increase your return is to take more risk. Why is that? The corollary of the first statement we made about risk, high risk, high return, is what? Low risk, low return. We don't have to say together. <laughs> because this is not the entrepreneurial mindset. So these two phrases sound very similar, but actually they mean something very different. When we say low risk, low return, what do we mean? We mean that if I take low risk, I will receive low return. This is a, a, as close to a, a law of economics as, as you can get. We cannot, another way to say this is, there are no low risk, high return opportunities. Agree or disagree? Anybody want to disagree? What's any example of low risk, high return opportunity? Lottery. Lottery. Yeah, I'm glad that somebody brought that up because <coughs> actually lottery is an, ex uh, it's an example of a extremely high risk, low return opportunity. Why? <laughs> Why, why do I say that? When, who runs a lottery? The government. I mean, the legal lottery is run by government. <laughs> why? Why does government run the lottery? It's a tax, right? It's an effectively a tax, so it's a guaranteed revenue stream for government, which means it's a guaranteed revenue loss for players, which means uh, it's a transfer of wealth from players to government which means that my investment in each lottery ticket is also guaranteed loss. So this is not a low risk, high return opportunity. What about, has anybody, okay, I'll illustrate this with one more example. How many people have found a $100 note in the street? Raise your hand. Or equivalent, okay. Okay, either, anybody? Okay, one person. Out of about, I would say, 200 people. So how many people have found small coins in the street? Everybody, right? Why is it that everybody finds small coins in the street, but nobody finds $100 bills in the street? I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. So actually, um, why is it? it? Is it because $100 bills never appear in the street? It's not the case, right? We know they appear sometimes. The reason is that when $100 bills do appear in the street, somebody else always finds them first, not you. <laughs> yeah. and, and usually this is a theoretical somebody else, but in our audience now we know who it is. It's, it's our friend. <laughs> He's the person that found it first. What does that mean in terms of real investment and real return? If low risk, high return opportunities do appear in markets, any market for a fleeting period of time, uh, investors rush into that opportunity and the return goes down and therefore goes away. So this is a, a supply and demand of capital issue. That's why there are no persistent uh, low risk, high return opportunities. That means we want to generate higher returns, we have to take more risk. So I advise if you take one thing away from my talk today, think about how much risk are you currently taking? And then figure out how to ratchet that risk up so you're taking more risk so that you can generate higher returns. Like, how many of you have, how many people here have heard about Bitcoin? How many people bought Bitcoin within the last four weeks? Uh, no, I'll tell you, I bought, I, I bought Bitcoin four weeks ago. Four or five weeks ago, just a little bit. You know the return on a Bitcoin in the last four weeks is what? What's the percentage return? It's a 430% from then till now, in the last month. 
I mean four and a half times, so about four and a half times. Why? Why is it generating such a high return over such a short period of time? Be because it's super risky, right? It's it increased by four and a half times over the last one month. It could go down and probably will go down more than that in the next, you know, sometime in the next 12 months. So when you first heard about it, what kept you from buying it was what? Don't want to take that risk. Therefore, give up that return. Now, how many people here are entrepreneurs? Aspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, would like to start a business someday. <laughs> Absolutely no interest in entrepreneurship. So one thing, uh, you know, I went to the Bitcoin conference in Singapore last week. It was the first Bitcoin conference in Asia. And I'm not promoting Bitcoin, just using this as an example of entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, I thought this uh, conference was highly, heavily populated by entrepreneurs that are thinking about, okay, not just how do I make money speculating in Bitcoin, because that's a super high risky endeavor, but is this a huge disruptive technology that's going to change uh, both financial, you know, currency markets and and uh, especially online purchasing. It, does that create tremendous, you know, if risky opportunities for entrepreneurs that might want to think about businesses in that area? So, are you thinking about that? I'm thinking about that ever since I attended that conference because this is uh, what we do in high in scalable entrepreneurship and also venture capital, which is in my area. We think about. How can I ratchet up the level of risk that I'm taking so that I can generate the highest possible return over the reasonable period of time? Okay, so I think that, that brings me to about uh, 10 minutes. So I hope that this short talk has gotten you thinking about uh, your own uh, propensity to take risk. Am I taking enough? Probably almost guaranteed the answer is no. Uh, how can I increase that in such a way that I generate the return that I want? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abrams, for his very enriching talk on taking risks. Right, so moving on to the next segment of the program is our open discussion on building disruptive innovations within and outside organizations. So please do take this opportunity to fire any questions you have at our panelists that are going to stage soon. So before, our, before we invite our panelists on stage, I'd like to introduce them. So our first panelist is Dr. Tan Sui who is currently the Deputy Director of the Biomedical Council of ASTAR. So Dr. Tan is also, the, is also the adjunct associate professor at Duke NUS Graduate Medical School, and he is a serial entrepreneur and a former nominated member of Parliament of Singapore. And he has served on the Board of Governors, Governors of the IP Academy of Singapore. Our second panelist is Dr. Lee Allen, who is the Corporate R&D Director of Procter & Gamble. With more than 10 years of R&D and managerial experience at PNG, she has significant experience building strong innovation tech strategies and constructing project portfolios to bring these strategies to life. So one of her strongest passions now is developing future innovators, encouraging students and young professionals to think different and create this continuous innovation. And our third panelist is somebody familiar to you, Mr. Hugh Mason, as we've just heard from you a while ago, who is the co-founder and CEO of GFDI Asia. So let's put our hands together and welcome the panelists on stage.